asked to share um, stories of our personal freedom today, but I wasn't very obedient um, in the sense that I felt I didn't want to share my story of personal freedom because I have a voice and I share it so much. So I've written a speech and I've tried to capture some of the freedom messages from the people from my community, so hence the, the notes. Not so long ago, this prison was a space for people who we decided decent society needed to be protected from. Not just robbers and murderers, but beggars, the mentally disabled, and even those who stole food during the famine. And here we are now, decent society in prison. How does it feel? For hundreds of years, we've been the ones who decided who to isolate and who didn't deserve freedom. Let's make no mistake about it. Just because we don't keep our beggars in prison anymore does not mean we don't isolate them. It does not mean that we don't decide who isn't good enough for our decent society. I entered politics because I wanted to give a voice to the people who we isolate today, to the people who we decide don't deserve to be free. So tonight I've decided not to use my voice, but to give a voice to some of the people who haven't been afforded the platform that I have. Through Facebook statuses, direct messages and conversations, I have pulled together some of the realities of a small portion of those from my community. All of these voices are real and happened within the last week. Facebook status number one. Did anyone else hear that bomb go off? My house just fucking shook. Comment. It was just across the road from me, in that fella's house, kids and all stuck in the house when it went off. Facebook status number two. A man has been beaten up in Brookfield. The scumbags then drove over him. He is dead. Locals had to pull the car off him. The children were playing on the road. They made sure that they killed him. Comments. Rest in peace. You will never be forgotten. What has this place become? When will this violence end? His poor children. Conversation. Lynn, I was so nervous meeting you this week. I get so anxious. We are friends since we are kids, but I worry I won't know what to say. This was my friend, who soon will be one year clean from heroin. When I decided not to take heroin, she took it. She sat in front of me yesterday and asked me, where has the time gone? One minute, our dads were dropping us swimming. The next, I'm 32, and I don't know what happened in my life. I tried to get clean and I went to the doctor, but the doctor refused me, said he wouldn't, he wouldn't make the application for me to go into treatment. He said I wasn't ready. She denied his, his insistence that she wasn't ready and she went and she got clean. This is the reality of heroin addiction for more than just my friend. One second you're a kid, the next you're either dead or an adult missing half their life. Facebook status number three. At 2.30 tomorrow, the 14th of April, I will light your candles, just like I do every day. It will be two years tomorrow since I last spoke to you. You are so happy talking to me. I'm pleading with people, please give information. You have it, I know you have the information. Our hearts are broken and this will never go away until we have my William and Anna home. So please talk up. This is the vice of the mother of my friend William, a young traveller man who was brutally murdered two years ago along with his partner, a Latvian girl, for not carrying out the demands of, of a local criminal gang. Text message. Lynn, I keep asking for help. No one is helping. They offered me an appointment for 10 days time. I've bought the rope, collected all my tablets, said all my goodbyes, but still no one is helping. I'm tired. Conversation. Lynn, I know no one realises this, but I was bullied as a kid for having dirty clothes, having to share my clothes with my brothers and not having what some other people had. I also used to get slagged for reading slowly in the class. I sold drugs and I took drugs because I wanted to change that. I wanted my own tracksuit and runners and I wanted them to be clean. Every day another friend dies, more violence surrounds me. And I don't know what I could have done to change that. I didn't know. I didn't know how not to be poor. 
What does freedom look like in these communities? Do we really have our freedom when the poor are punished, ignored, and a Facebook status is often their only platform? As we stand here in Kilmainham Jail, contemplating freedom, we think about the physical walls built to keep people in and to keep people out. But what if your liberation depends on everything and everyone but yourself? What if the recognition of your class and the circumstances born from, born from your class does little to change that? What if the walls surrounding you were invisible? What if those walls weren't bricks and mortar, but social disadvantage, a disadvantage that was out of your control, but you got blamed for it anyway? What does it mean to be free? Imagine somebody decided to lock us in here, taking our freedom away. What's the difference between that and being born into poverty, in an area where university is ridiculed, where the only economic opportunities are criminal? Are we even responsible for our own freedom, or is it purely circumstantial? And what about us, decent society? Do we have a responsibility to question our own freedom, to question our obligation to those whose freedom we've taken away? More importantly, are we even free, or is freedom just an illusion? I was asked to give an account of the moment I found freedom. I refuse to do so. Ni sersha, go sersha illa. There is no freedom until all are free. Thank you.